Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm going to be uh, going from uh, 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 these presentations that preceded me, which had a very, uh, I think, a very important global, uh, con uh, a global significance, but very local context. Uh, I'm going to actually do a, a somewhat reverse. I'm going to actually start with a, a sense of what the issues are in terms of global mental health and then drill down more locally into a program of work that I've been involved with in India over the last five years. But I was reminded about how important context uh, is, uh, listening particularly to your talk, David, but also uh, the subsequent talk. Uh, I think you mentioned something really interesting which reminded me of that, when you said, um, you know, that app use uh, has a pattern that mimics a hockey stick. Uh, and I kind of wondered about that a little bit because, uh, you know, um, at least the hockey sticks I know actually curve up at the end of the hockey stick. And then I realized, of course, it's a different kind of hockey you play in this country, uh, which is why your hockey sticks stay flat uh, at the bottom. And you know, context therefore does matter. I was also you know, quite interested, uh, similarly, when uh, we heard a lot about the care system and about how much effort is being made to actually uh, support providers uh, in ensuring better quality care to patients. Well, of course, the problem in most parts of the world is there actually is no care system uh, for mental health care, and there are actually no providers for mental health care. So the kind of foci for, or the targets for much of the digital mental health work uh, is actually building a provider base uh, to actually reach mental health care rather than actually reaching patients. Also. Let's not forget that there is a huge digital divide. Uh, no matter how much you hear about how the digital revolution, the fact remains that even in a country like India, uh, which has such an enormous IT industry, fully 75% of people do not have access uh, to, to the internet. So let's, let's also be a little bit more uh, aware that in the global context, we still have a very long way to go before we achieve that uh, sort of um, access to digital technologies. Nevertheless, let me start with a big, uh, little bit of a preamble about the issues that we face globally in terms of access to mental health care. And then, as I said, I'll drill down a little bit more into ongoing work uh, that is happening with my partner organization in India, Sangat. So this is a slide that oh, many of you will be familiar with, a slide that shows that no matter how you organize countries of the world according to the development index over the last 25 years, there has been a 50% increase in the proportionate burden uh, of mental and subs uh, substance use disorders in pretty much all countries of the world, including the poorest countries of the world. And much of this increase is being really driven by uh, this particular chart. Uh, what it demonstrates is the real surge in the proportionate burden of mental disorders it two different uh, age groups. Um, the one that's really important to us is the one in young adulthood. It's important not only because mental and substance use disorders typically emerge during this phase of life, but also very important uh, from the uh, perspective of this particular conference, this is in fact the age group that is embracing uh, digital technology. So if I had to then look at the proportion of young people, let's say in India or Sub-Saharan Africa, who have access to smartphones, it would be three or four times greater than their parents' generation. We also know that there are enormous uh, social impacts of these conditions, particularly on the economies in terms, particularly of mood and anxiety and substance use disorders again, which is really the focus of my, of my presentation in, the, in this first preamble, um, both in terms of uh, the enormous amount of time lost due to these mental health problems uh, and the consequences that has on productivity. In spite of this big evidence uh, on the burden of these disorders, the truth is that m virtually no country in the world actually spends on mental health care in a way that is proportionate to the burden of these conditions in, in, in those countries. So in this slide, I've organized the countries of the world according to uh, their income status. So this is the World Bank classification. And so this shows you the proportionate burden of the total burden of disease that can be attributable to mental and substance use conditions. And then this next set of bars shows you the proportion of the healthcare budgets um, that is spent on mental health care. Now, of course, this shows inequities in all countries of the world, but particularly uh, 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 enormous when you look at the poorest countries of the world. And the net result, of course, of this very low spending is that there is virtually no care system for mental health problems in most parts of the world. I would say roughly 75% of the world's population uh, would simply not even understand what you mean by a mental health care system in the context of the presentations we've just had.
And of course, the consequence of that uh, is that the coverage of minimally effective treatment, and David uh, spoke to this already, uh, but I just wanted to show you something important. The first, of course, is this, these are the poorest countries of the world, the low and middle income countries, the least resourced, not necessarily the poorest. Um, uh, and here you can see that more than 95% of people do not receive minimally effective treatment. If this particular graph was specifically on psychological therapies, which is the focus of so much uh, digital mental health interventions, it would be almost 100%. Um, so even these 2 to 4% represent essentially access to antidepressant medication. There's virtually no psychotherapy available almost anywhere in Africa uh, and most parts of Asia. So in, in essence, this is already an incredibly large treatment gap. But what was interesting to me when I saw these data was that even in countries like the US and Western Europe, which have 1,000 times more uh, of every kind of mental health resource you can imagine from mental health professionals to dollars spent per person to the number of beds, even there, there are such large quality access gaps. Uh, and clearly, the important point here, for, for me at least, from this, the takeaway message here, is that simply throwing more money into, uh, uh, into the way we organize mental health care today isn't necessarily going to, in fact, reduce these gaps. And of course, this conference is really hand, uh, tackling uh, you know, what might be alternative ways of thinking of delivering care. Last week in The Lancet, we published uh, the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development. Uh, for those of you who want to access the commission, you can go on this website. Uh, and importantly, uh, as we were assembling the very large evidence base on issues to do with reducing the burden of suffering due to mental health problems globally, uh, amongst the four key innovations that, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, that we recommended that were ready for further scale up uh, was, of course, digital technologies. But just, I want, I want to highlight uh, the, the word that is already highlighted here, uh, and this really reflects the very early stage uh, of evidence on how these technologies can actually transform mental health, particularly in low-resource settings. Um, and, and the reason for this, of course, is that while we are very bullish and excited about the prospects, the truth, of course, is that there's very little, and we heard you know, from the previous talks that there's a lot of evidence, but of course, there seems to be an enormous challenge on how this evidence can actually translate uh, into real-world impact. A couple of years ago, uh, my colleague uh, John Nasland uh, produced this uh, systematic review. I think Stephen Bartels was involved with that as well. Uh, we stole John from Stephen's shop, and then Stephen joined us here as well, which is great. Uh, but we, we did a, a, a systematic review uh, of uh, the evidence on digital technologies from low- and middle-income countries, and actually it turned out to be quite a significant evidence base, nearly 50 studies from 20-odd countries, uh, and targeting a range of different kinds of mental health conditions and interventions. So the key point, though, from this systematic review was that not a single study met the criteria of what we might consider acceptable evidence on impact. So these were largely studies exploring acceptability, design, and feasibility, really, rather than any impact. Nevertheless, these were the sorts of areas where people in global health settings are really innovating in the use of uh, digital technologies. And I really want to highlight the very first one. Uh, this is still where we're really struggling. How do we actually bring a workforce that is not a mental health workforce, because the mental health workforce does not exist, uh, how do we get the non-mental health workforce to be skilled to provide, especially, psychological therapies uh, for mental health problems. How do we facilitate diagnosis and detection? Let me give you an example. Virtually no child with autism will be diagnosed with that condition unless he or she is usually into primary or secondary school. This is because no one knows what autism is in most parts of the world. How do we empower parents and frontline workers with the tools, and how can digital technology make that happen, to actually detect that their child might have a developmental problem before it's picked up uh, much later in life because the child is having difficulties uh, in, in, in the school environment. How do we promote treatment adherence? A huge problem, which of course I think is something which uh, uh, is equally true in this country, but also supporting recovery. How do we actually engage people who are often very isolated because of their serious mental illness, uh, often imprisoned even in their own homes? Uh, how do we get them to connect with other people? How do we use the incredible opportunities of social media uh, to actually connect people, for example, who live with a condition like schizophrenia?
Self-help, we've heard a lot about that in the previous two talks, and that, of course, is very important as well, uh, and substance use and prevention and treatment. So these are the five big focus areas that we identified uh, in, this, in this review. Now I'm going to switch uh, over uh, from this big picture of what's happening in global mental health and its relationship with digital technologies to describe a few ongoing areas of work that I'm engaged with in India. So Sangat is an organization, it's a non-profit organization that has been my partner uh, for the last 20 years uh, and, and continues to be so since I moved to Harvard Medical School uh, last year. Uh, so essentially the areas of work that we're working with Sangat are really organized into these three areas, building the workforce, uh, delivering interventions and engaging the public. And I'm going to give you some examples of each of these in the next few slides. So let me start with building a workforce. Now, much of the energy in global mental health today is to equip frontline workers, community health workers, peers, uh, police officers, a whole range of providers who are often the first responders for people with mental health problems, not just in crisis settings, uh, but obviously including that. And one NIMH program that I'm leading uh, is called Essence, where we're really trying to uh, develop tools for frontline workers in India. They're called ASHA workers, they're community health workers, um, to deliver a behavioral activation treatment. This is a very well-established treatment, but we've also demonstrated uh, a six-session uh, BA treatment for depression. Uh, this image actually comes from, from, from the digital manual uh, for, uh, for these health workers. And so when we did the formative work uh, to really ask ASHA workers, you know, we, we, we first of all want to make sure that the user of this platform is going to actually find this something that is of help to them, that is something that they will actually find acceptable. And these are just some of the narratives uh, that they spoke to that demonstrated the enthusiasm to embrace digital training, and you can see the reasons why. Um, as opposed to the orthodox system, which is of course currently the system for all health worker training, you've got to come to a workshop, um, you've got to land up in a place uh, which is often away from your home for maybe four or five days. Um, that is of course the minimum amount of time for a workshop to learn a psychotherapy. You also have to have the psychotherapy expert come in. And of course, there are not that many experts who speak Hindi, which means, therefore, you need to have, you know, you can begin to imagine what an enormous, enormous bottleneck there is to scaling up the rich evidence on the delivery of these interventions by frontline workers. So essentially, a digital platform offers uh, not just ease of access for all these sorts of reasons. The other thing I want to say about community health workers is this woman is actually a community health worker. This is not her only job. So she's also working in the fields, uh, and she's also, of course, looking after her family. So the idea of going away for five days is simply not comprehensible uh, uh, to most people. So the digital world actually offers an amazing opportunity for people to learn something at their own convenience. So this is the platform we're designing. It's pretty, pretty uh, basic. But you know, this is where we're working on. Uh, this is the sort of context that we're working with. So the platform really has several different components. Um, you've got the, the, the e-learning platform where you learn how to deliver uh, specific elements of psychotherapy like BA and, and, and exposure and so on. You then have a therapist competency assessment for which also we have an NIMH grant which is helping us design an online way, way of assessing competency uh, for, for, for these frontline workers. We then have shown that peer-to-peer -peer supervision using social media networks uh, is a very effective way for quality assurance and continuing professional development. Uh, and that's linked to an EMR system, which is pretty uh, open source uh, MRS system, uh, which allows peers to not only complete assessments, but also share it with one another for supervision. Uh, and then we're also exploring how this provider platform can then link with tools that can be provided to their patients uh, in the form of apps. So ultimately, if I look at the provider process, you start as a trainee where you complete your learning for a particular psychological therapy. You have internships where you master the therapy supervised by experts. You then start working in the clinical context with patients, building up a report uh, on your own log, which is a way of also monitoring your CPD. Uh, you have peer supervision, and when you achieve certain basic criteria, for example, the number of hours of supervision, you can become an expert and then actually supervise trainees. So the whole system has an inbuilt way of sustainability. Ultimately, the goal is to remove the need for an expert who is a highly qualified person because they don't exist, and essentially make the frontline worker an expert uh, themselves. Uh, the second important area of work that we engage with is in diagnosis and assessment, particularly in children. 
and we have two ongoing uh, uh, programs of work. Uh, uh, this is a program, basically both these programs involve games uh, with very young children aged between two and five years old. And the, the, the two different goals for that, the first uh, uh, is, to, is to monitor cognitive development, which some of you may be aware is one of the greatest threats uh, to well-being in, 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 in the, in, for children in Africa and Asia, uh, mainly because of the blights of undernutrition uh, and a variety of different adversities that have impacts on the developing brain in early life. Again, the, 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 the impact of this is only felt much later in life when these children get into school and have struggles with actually coping with learning requirements and they drop out of school. Uh, and of course, the great opportunity we have of early intervention is lost by them. So this also applies to children with more atypical development in the form of autism. And so what we have is uh, two ongoing programs that we're merging into a common digital platform, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. So the first platform, uh, the first uh, 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 tool is a two and a half minute game uh, that is Im embedded in the game are six different assessments derived from the Bailey's uh, uh, scales. Uh, and the, this is just one example of some of the screenshots of the games uh, for attention and cognition. And what we are doing right now is we are validating this game in a rural population. And our goal ultimately is to generate normal distributions at a population level, much like you do for growth curves. Many of you may be familiar with this, maybe it's not used in the US as much, but certainly in the developing world, this is a very powerful tool for frontline workers to monitor children's growth trajectories. And so what we imagine is using this composite of multiple domain scores to really create developmental uh, 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 curves just like this so you can actually map a child according to their chronological age and also monitor a child uh, over time when they get interventions. And the second uh, uh, tool is, 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 the, is the start one, and this basically really uh, is examining whether the well-recognized psychopathology of autism to do with social preference and attentional disengagement can in fact be assessed using eye tracking. Now, of course, eye tracking has been widely used, not, not least at Boston Children's Hospital with Charles Nelson's lab, but here we're using eye tracking on iPads uh, or smartphones in, in children's own homes. Uh, and so that requires quite a lot of technological adaptation because you can't control the environment. Uh, in the same way that you can in a lab. And so the final aim of the second platform, the first platform was a provider platform, this is a platform for, for early child development, uh, is really that you have uh, uh, these two different uh, 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 digital technologies built on one another. The first is a, uh, an uh, assessment of a range of different cognitive domains for those children who have uh, some evidence of delay that triggers a more specific set of assessments that are uh, mapping onto uh, uh, deeper phenotypes of, of atypical development, uh, and then finally those children who are uh, showing uh, atypical uh, patterns are then referred for clinical diagnosis to a specialist hospital in the city. So this is a way of actually getting out to a much larger population. They're not diagnostic tools, they're really risk profiling tools. And lastly, um, to improve mental health, I'm not going to say much about this because I think what we're doing is I, probably quite... Um, basic compared to the apps that we've just heard about earlier. Uh, but here we're working mostly with uh, uh, young adults, uh, young people, uh, adolescents. This is a school in New Delhi uh, where we are developing a gaming a based app, and this is ultimately intended to bolt on to the provider training. So the idea is if you're seeing a 14 or 15 year old, you're equipped now with the skills to deliver, let's say, behavioral activation, you can then give the kid, if they have a phone, this particular app to do continuing self-care uh, in, their, in their own homes. Uh, I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move along. Important points here to, to really note is language. Um, this is an extremely important issue because, of course, only a fraction of the world's population speak English. Uh, um, uh, there are about 400 million Hindi language speakers and maybe a billion Mandarin language speakers. Uh, and so, really, the whole energy in digital global mental health is access to people who don't actually speak English, who may have relatively poor internet connectivity, so that's why it has to work offline as well. I, I, that, that's not clear. Yeah, that's right. It has to work offline. Um, uh, it has to work on really low-end phones, and it has to work with, uh, you know, the sorts of speeds that you probably don't see in this country. Maybe in rural America, I'm told, you see those sorts of speeds, uh, but certainly not in Boston. So you, you really have to make sure that these technologies are actually accessible uh, to very diverse populations.
A very simple example is still text messaging. Many of you may think this is completely outdated, but actually this is pretty useful, uh, and we're using text messaging as well, uh, especially again, uh, with, with people who only, only have analog phones, which is still a very, very common kind of phone device uh, in this particular case for, uh, for, for, for young people who have drinking problems. And lastly, I want to end uh, by uh, uh, the, the final component is engaging the public. Um, here we're using another very basic uh, 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 digital uh, uh, tool, which is simply an, the internet, social media. Uh, and this is a website called It's OK to Talk, which is a rapidly growing uh, uh, network in India, which is really trying to get young people to disclose stories uh, uh, about their own mental health experiences. And the real, uh, uh, the, the, the real rationale for this is that by disclosure and by engaging young people, not only because they're a risk group, but also because they're the ones who are most uh, open-minded and embracing both digital technologies as well as conversations about mental health, uh, that this will be one way to really challenge the stigma and discrimination against mental health problems. And you can see some of the ways in which stories can be shared uh, through this, this platform. This is yet another platform, multiple different components, including uh, you know, it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc., uh, that allows people uh, to engage. So that's, uh, that's really my... Uh, my last slide. Uh, I just wanted to end by saying, and you know, from, from the global mental health uh, uh, context, I think the, the context is really one of a huge unmet need uh, for care for people with mental health problems. Uh, that spans the entire continuum from detection all the way uh, to equipping providers and with people who are affected with knowledge and skills. Uh, and so the, the suite of digital mental uh, uh, health opportunities is really quite vast. In some ways, actually much greater than, uh, than in the US where there's already a very strong superstructure of of a healthcare system. And I'd say that some of the most exciting innovations that are happening in digital health are actually happening in the global south. Not so much in mental health, we're just actually following on, but there's already enormous innovations, for example, in HIV AIDS care. So a lot of what we're doing is actually uh, really following other global health uh, innovators, such as the HIV community, rather than the digital mental health world um, that is really to a large extent, still very, very focused on the global north. So I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much.